Hi, I'm Courtney Duncan, and I'm here to talk to you about the importance of technical hobbies such as amateur radio to the development of technology in the world at large. So I spent the last a few decades working at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. One day I was on the way to lunch with a QST under my arm and a colleague in the elevator stopped and asked, he saw what this was and he knew what it was and he stopped me and asked, uh, is there still such a thing as ham radio? And I was a little bit shocked by this, of course there is. I mean, I think the gist of the question was, well, the art of radio is 100 years old and we've solved all the big problems and all of the uh, goals and such are driven by big business and big government and so forth and why is there a need for an avocation where people sit around and play with radios anymore? Well, so I think those assumptions that may underlie that question are incomplete. And I would say the answer is yes, because sometimes when you're just fooling around basically off the clock, uh, practicing a hobby or an avocation, you discover things that make an unexpected difference and you wouldn't even know this if you were uh, working toward a specific goal. So here are some examples. It starts with the beginning of radio itself. Um, around 1917, as the amateurs and the commercial stations were separating themselves from each other, um, down around a megahertz or so, um, rules were written that relegated the amateurs to 200 meters and down. You know, they thought in terms of uh, wavelength more than in frequency. So 200 meters is 1500 kilohertz. So that would have been 1500 kilohertz and up. And the conventional wisdom at the time was that um, radio was only good uh, for a distance of about 500 waves from the transmitter. And so at 200 meters, uh, 500 waves would be about 100 kilometers. And um, if we put the hams, the hobbyist, above that, then not only can they not get out beyond 100 kilometers, but they won't be on the frequencies that are really useful. And so hams had two responses to this. One was that, um, and this was kind of the genesis of the American Radio Relay Leak, um, many of the hams got together on 200 meters and tried to set up a relay network and develop a, a message relaying discipline. And as they did this, uh, the uh, set of call signs listed here, um, and, and these uh, calls were all uh, made up by the, the people at the time before they were actually assigned by the government, but these guys all got together uh, one evening and they were able to relay a message using Morse code across the country in 80 minutes, which was considered to be good. And then on a later evening, they, um, they went out and sent a message all the way across the country. And then an answer was sent back uh, overnight. Now, at the same time this was going on, some other amateurs were kind of tuning around as, as we would think of it today. They were going down below 200 meters to see if there was anything that we could do down there. And they more or less accidentally discovered that uh, if you were down at a wavelength of 20 meters, just unthinkably short, um, you, could, <laughs> you could work across the country at high noon and uh, do message uh, transmission in a single hop. And so, Fast forward a couple of decades when the rules were written next time, uh, really formally in 1934, well, all the frequencies now up to 110 kilohertz, that would be about three meters, were uh, assigned out. And um, hams did have six bands in that range. And so they were acknowledged as being useful. Now, I'll also point out that um, in this period of time, we're talking about uh, World War I, um, uh, the United States joined World War I and hams were put off of the air at that time. But what happened was that many uh, amateurs 
showed up for duty in the war with their stations. You couldn't just go out and buy radio equipment uh, in that quantity or that easily at the time. And people with the equipment and the expertise showed up with their equipment and, and went to war and were assigned to ships and other places that uh, needed or that could use radio communication. And, you know, this kind of heroism really was kind of part of what um, led to uh, amateur radio being reinstated after the war was over in 1919. A, a deal was made that put hams back on the air. Okay, here, so here's another example of someone basically fooling around, could well have been wasting their time, and uh, yet made a, uh, a fundamental contribution to science, and that's Grote Reber, W9GFZ. Now, Carl Jansky had discovered that there was cosmic radio sources. There was radio sources in the sky in 1931. Um, but at, at Bell Labs, but there was not uh, a whole lot of follow-up on this. There was it was the depression and other things were going on. But Carl uh, Grote Reber got uh, very interested in uh, this, so much so that he built this um, he built this nine-meter uh, parabolic uh, dish in his backyard in Wheaton, Illinois, and much to the delight of his neighbors, I would imagine, and. Um, he basically scanned the sky to see if there was more radio sources. So he tried this on several frequencies and, and finally did make a radio map at 160 megahertz. And the way this works, this, this is not an, um, an as L mount like we would think of it today. This is just an elevation map and the dish is basically pointed south. And you just point up in the sky and you let the earth rotation take you through the different um, right ascensions on the sky. And so you point it uh, at a certain elevation and then you make a strip chart of the noise you see at the frequency you're measuring. And then you point it at a different elevation tomorrow and make another strip chart. And after some days of this, you can put strip charts in together to a, um, uh, to a radio map of the sky. This is what Grote did and he published this result. And after World War II, um, this generated a lot of interest in what is now called radio astronomy. John Krauss, for instance, who we all know as the guy who wrote the book on antennas, um, W.H.J.K., uh, set up the Big Ear at uh, University of Ohio, and this uh, facility was credited with, um, uh, they looked for radio sources at the hydrogen line, 14, 15 megahertz. Uh, the, the 1,415 megahertz, and uh, they cataloged 20,000 sources. So now there was a good radio map of the sky. Now, of interest here, um, so there was a lot of uh, radio astronomy coverage in the 50s and 60s in the microwaves. And so Grote Reber became uh, interested in the parts that weren't being covered. That is down around a megahertz or a half a megahertz or 10 megahertz. And he went, uh, he moved to Tasmania, which is a place which is quiet at these frequencies and set up a telescope there to uh, uh, see what measurements could be made um, at the lower frequencies to, to, to fill in the, uh, the map. And that's where they spent the rest of his life. Now, what's interesting here is that um, we have a mission out of JPL in collaboration with the University of Michigan called Sunrise. And this is led by uh, Jim Lux, W6RMK, and several of my ham buddies at work uh, listed here are uh, involved in the science and engineering of that uh, mission. What Sunrise is going to do, it's, it's going to use these same frequencies that uh, Grote Reber was interested in, half a megahertz up to 20 or 30 megahertz. And they're going to listen to these frequencies from a swarm of CubeSats, uh, six of them, at a geosynchronous orbit. And this will allow for the first time a correlation between um, uh, solar flares optically observed and observed in radio. Right now, the, we can see a correlation from, from the earth, from the ground um, of um, uh, solar flares in the optical and we know that radio flares are occurring, but we don't know which part of the sun they come from. And this instrument uh, that will be uh, launched as early as next year um, 
is set out to uh, measure and, and find the, those actual locations. So this work is uh, still going on and still uh, uh, very active, and radio astronomy is a fundamental uh, field of science at this point. Here's another kind of astronomy. Uh, one of my heroes, uh, William Herschel, he was the church organist at uh, uh, Bath, England, by day. And, uh, but he was obsessed with the building and using of telescopes uh, for optical astronomy. And um, he built telescopes. It shows here a picture from Wikipedia of he and his sister polishing a parabolic mirror and setting up a telescope. And then at night, he used them uh, to make maps of the sky. I think this telescope here is basically the same thing we were looking at on, uh, on uh, radio astronomy. Uh, this is a transit scope that looks south, and you just uh, watch the stars drift through it. And when it crosses the crosshairs, you mark the time. And so that's how you know, the, uh, you know how high you're pointed, so you know the declination and you know the right ascension by the time. And uh, he made a map of the sky of the objects he could see with the telescope and discovered uh, the planet Uranus, which was originally called Herschel after him. And this was the first planet in the solar system discovered since antiquity. Um, he also several moons of planets, uh, several minor planets, uh, because they're moving around against the stars that are not otherwise moving. The nebulae he uh, started a catalog of. Um, these, uh, you know, he didn't know what he was looking at yet, but he made the first catalogs. And of course, he wasn't a radio amateur. Can you, uh, can you see why that is? But this is a case of a technical hobbyist making a fundamental contribution to science because he had time to spend on it and didn't, he was interested in what he would find and it didn't matter if that became important but it did end up becoming important uh, foundational to uh, um, optical astronomy. So this is the Mars project. Uh, Dr. Werner von Braun um, wrote this monograph in 1953 to show in complete enough detail that you could take the technology of the time and mount a piloted mission to the planet Mars and land and get samples and come back to the Earth. And what this is, is a, uh, it's a few hundred pages of a book. It's eight pages of text followed by several appendices. And of interest here is Appendix F, which is uh, basically uh, a classic interplanetary radio link performance analysis. Um, the first one that I know of and um, Whoever did this analysis, um, he understood the equipment that was available at the time. He understood the, free, uh, the physics of the frequencies that would be used. And uh, to the extent that it was understood, the, uh, the media that the radio waves would be going through. And he came to the conclusion that with existing technology, you could, you could communicate with a piloted mission uh, for several weeks by voice. And then the SNR would get low enough that you'd have to go to... CWR Morse code, but that on Morse code or on a radio teletype, you'd be able to go uh, bridge the distance from Earth to Mars as far as Mars could be from the Earth. And so you'd be able to have uh, constant communication uh, during the execution of this mission. Now, in the, in the other appendices of these books, he designs the rocket, he designs all the trajectories. What you're looking at here is uh, one of the things that fascinated me as a kid, this shows the departure trajectory from the Earth, where you leave a circular Earth orbit and you go on this hyperbolic path, and then this asymptotically approaches something that's the transfer orbit from Earth to Mars. And I was uh, very interested in this and I poured over these diagrams uh, as a kid. And um, so, you know, I was interested in more than just the radio aspects of this. Now, I say the people who were working for Von Braun, he had a large team of um, German rocket scientists who were expatriated to the United States in Operation Paperclip at the end of World War II. And I suspect that although some of these people, these people were technology experts and some of them were radio experts, I doubt that they uh, 
would have been encouraged or even allowed to have uh, amateur radio licenses, but they probably would have if they could have, um, if they weren't being kept too busy at work by Von Braun. And um, whoever's on this team, they did a really excellent job of uh, designing a radio system. And I think this is in the spirit of uh, amateur radio or, or professional radio, which as you will see in the examples is uh, often a bit blurred. As for example, in this uh, case, so this is Project Diana. This is the first time uh, that a verified uh, a signal was bounced off the moon and detected back at the Earth. And what happened here was that, um, uh, so what were they doing at the Evans Signal Laboratory? Well, they were doing research in radar, which was a new technology in World War II. And they, um, um, had been supporting the war effort, and then the war was over. And as with most big government projects, the uh, the motivation and the funding was going to go away. And they were all told that we're going to close down the lab here in a few months, and you need to clean up your paperwork and get everything finished uh, so that we can lay you off and you can go find another job. But before you go, we have a question we'd like you to consider. And that is, we think that in the near future, uh, the next big threat might be intercontinental ballistic missiles. And we wonder, I mean, the conventional wisdom at the time, believe it or not, was that um, uh, radio waves could not meaningfully penetrate the ionosphere. <laughs> this is despite the fact that Grote Reber's work that was going on right then. Um, but the, the conventional wisdom was that radio waves wouldn't go out of the ionosphere. And so if an ICBM was approaching from outside the atmosphere, you wouldn't be able to see it until it got down into the atmosphere. And by then it would be too late to do anything really meaningful. So the question was, if the ICBM is up in space coming from somewhere, could you build a radar to detect it? And uh, Colonel DeWitt uh, in for CBC, and uh, King Stadola and uh, W2AXO and uh, a few other um, engineers, some of whom were hams, all got together and they said, well, you know, the moon is a pretty big object and it's not so far away that we couldn't uh, detect a signal. It would only be a couple of seconds uh, light time out and back. And so, you know, if we do the calculations carefully, uh, maybe we can demonstrate a radio signal going through the ionosphere, both on the outbound and inbound from the moon. And if we can do that detection, then that will answer the question. Now, that would not be the radar that would detect ICBMs, but it would be, um, it would be a yes answer to the question and it would indicate future research. So we, and, and you see that they, they did achieve this in January, 1946. This uh, here is the, um, oscilloscope trace from the outgoing signal there, and it's calibrated in miles, uh, two-way. So here's the return signal they detected, uh, 238,000 miles, and so that's the moon. This is the bedstead array, which uh, is 64 dipoles at 110 megahertz, and it doesn't steer in elevation. It only steers in azimuth, and they use the Earth rotation to make the moon rise and set, so they could only do tests right around uh, when the moon was near the horizon. But that's the way it worked, and the reason we know so much about this now is because um, King Stadola's daughter, Cindy, um, who had interviewed her, her dad about this work that was being done when she was a toddler, and of course she knew nothing about it because it was all classified and uh, kids growing up aren't interested in those things. Uh, but she did interviews later and, and uh, wrote a book on this, and, um, which, you can, uh, which you can look at. And, um, you know, so some of the interesting things, it, it looks very familiar to, to the way that hams work today. Uh, they were told, you know, you have all this equipment there. You can't buy anything new. You can't develop any new equipment, no new transmitters or receivers. You have to use what you have uh, to answer this question. And so they were able to do that uh, successfully. Um, signals reflected off the moon were then very interesting, and, and this was not highly celebrated at the time. It was kind of a military secret uh, for what seems to me like obvious reasons, and um, uh, various agencies set up 
moon reflection detecting or, or using systems for communication or for espionage even. But um, after uh, artificial satellites started coming into vogue, then uh, uh, really the only people who've done the moon bounce since has been radio amateurs. And this goes till today. This, uh, this blog here that I uh, cite is quite lengthy, it has a you know, long history of amateur radio moon bounce. And, and it took me about a year to <laughs> read through and digest the whole thing. So speaking of satellites, here's the next example. So people started launching satellites into space with Sputnik in 1957. And every time there's a launch, um, the rocket has more capacity, more power than the payload actually needs. And so the rocket is trimmed and balanced out with ballast, which is sand or lead or water or something. And radio amateurs saw this as a travesty. You know, this is a waste of mass that's going into orbit and basically found ways to ask, well, could we put a radio transmitter on as part of your ballast? And basically the rules became, well, uh, you can do that if you prove that you won't hurt anything that the paying customer is doing, that the primary payload is doing. And if you show that you're worthwhile, and so starting with Oscar 1 in 1961, only four years after the first satellites, uh, amateurs had, they basically pioneered the idea of piggyback payloads and they had uh, amateur radio in space. Oscar is an acronym for orbiting satellite carrying amateur radio. Now, interestingly, HAMS had a lock on this piggyback business for about 30 or 40 years. Um, both through Project Oscar and later the Radio Amateur Satellite Corporation, uh, AMSAT, uh, providing uh, payloads on a uh, secondary basis uh, through many launchers and, and for many purposes. Um, I've pictured here LUSAT Oscar 19 as an example of one of the satellites that was launched in 1990 with a group of, uh, it was one of six amateur satellites on the Ariane 4 V35 mission. Um, so that mission, and I was involved in AMSAT at the time, so I was kind of an insider on this action. That mission was interesting with respect to the fact that it was the first time, or it was one of the first times that amateurs actually paid uh, for launch space on a, on a launcher. Ariana Spas was qualifying their ASAP, their Ariane structure for auxiliary payloads. And the six amateur satellites were mounted on this ASAP structure to see if they could actually support in kind of a routine and profitable way uh, such piggyback payloads. And so AMSAT and all the other six payloads each paid $27,000 for each of these seats. And that was based on the uh, exchange rate with French francs on the day that the, the fees were paid. And with this flight, the, all these uh, spacecraft were deployed successfully and the ASAP was qualified. And ever after that, seats on the, on the auxiliary structure costed over a million dollars a piece. And so this was kind of a game changer in the business and for the, Next 20 years, there was a lot of players um, who came along at universities, AMSAT uh, continued to be involved, uh, small businesses, even um, NASA got into the small piggyback payload business and, and still is basically. Uh, this has evolved into uh, quite an interesting um, uh, uh, feature in the marketplace, uh, but um, as a result of this huge success, um, uh, AMSAT itself, amateur radio participation has kind of become minor, and, and this is kind of what happens. You know, it kind of reminds me of the 200 meters and down story. We spent 30 years proving something was valuable, and then once the people with money realize that, then uh, we kind of get uh, run off to the side, which is kind of what your technical hobbies should be doing. They should be showing something that's surprisingly useful and then stepping on to the next thing that uh, might or might not be a waste of time. In fact, in that, uh, in that vein, my favorite is um, 
what will become of this in the future? So while everyone else in the world is headed for higher bandwidth and putting uh, position information and, and um, lots of data in everybody's hand, uh, every person on the planet, the hams are kind of going the opposite direction. They're saying, well, what can we do uh, to extend our reach, to extend the capability of our equipment by going to lower and lower bandwidths? Um, uh, and as uh, the prime example, Nobel laureate Joe Taylor, K1GT, uh, JT, has spent his retirement uh, leading a team that's enabling hams to see what they can do at, at uh, really low data rates, uh, one bit per second or a few bits per second. And um, this basically puts us 10 or 20 or even more dB further out uh, than we were before with just the standalone um, ham equipment. So for instance, on the right here, this is the uh, my WSJT screen last December when I was working HS0ZOP in Thailand, uh, Thailand on 23 centimeter EME. Now you can see in the waterfall up here, there's, um, there's not enough signal I mean, I could barely hear that there was a signal there, but there's not enough even for a CW contact, but there's plenty um, to uh, use advanced coding and decoding and, and uh, non-coherent modulation and so forth. There's plenty to exchange all the information necessary for a complete QSO, which you see here in the, uh, in the status screen. And so that counts as a contact. And this just would not have been possible between the two stations uh, without this uh, enhanced uh, software capability. So what this means is that it enables much smaller stations to do things like this. That puts a lot more people on EME and on tropo scatter on microwaves and, and in other uh, places in, in amateur radio. It gives them, uh, it gives the existing stations uh, more distance. Uh, so more capability, more things they can do. And so the question today is, well, where is this going to lead? Will this be a similar story? Will we accidentally discover something that's really uh, valuable that uh, in 20 or 30 years, uh, someone will pick up and uh, run us out of it? Um, I don't know. I don't know what the future will be of this, but this is an excellent example of what uh, um, kind of things that amateur radio is pushing forward with even today. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. Um, I told my story on QSO today, so you can go listen to that. But relevant to this discussion is the fact that in my mid-20s, I went back to college for a second bachelor's degree in engineering. And I did pretty well in that degree, basically because from amateur radio experience, from doing my own soldering, from doing my own equipment modifications, from building kits, from operating on the air, I kind of knew what was going on here. I kind of knew the answers. Uh, you know, we're studying um, the underlying mathematics and principles of radio, but I knew <laughs> I knew where this was headed. And so I, when I'm working on a problem, if it starts to look like something that I don't believe is physical, then I would know that and I would know to look for mistakes. And so, you know, just from the seat of the pants knowledge of how the whole thing was supposed to work, I um, um, was did quite well. And as a student who was doing quite well, then I was eligible to be hired as a co-op student at uh, NASA Johnson Space Center. And I happened to be working there when Owen Gary at W5LFL uh, flew on STS-6, a space shuttle mission, and um, put amateur radios in space for the first time. And so I remember that day when, when they were launched into orbit and we're all uh, computing when the first STS-6 pass will be over Houston. And we all ran out with our HTs uh, when that pass was gonna happen. And, and we were gonna try to work Owen uh, right there on the first pass. Of course, in the mission timeline that we weren't all that aware of, uh, they hadn't even un unbuckled, much less unpacked <laughs> the, the ham gear yet. So <laughs> there was no one on that pass, but later on, um, we did work him, and later on, uh, we all met him at W5 Triple R club meetings, and he and Owen and other uh, astronauts who were involved in in what then became uh, 
another uh, forefront of uh, amateur radio and professional radio kind of working together to the common good. Now, in my own case, um, my employment there, I ended up working at a spinoff company doing embedded software for uh, paging systems. And that went on my resume. And at home, uh, I was working on a project for AMSAT, um, AMS-81 satellite tracking software for this computer pictured here, the Sinclair ZX-81. This was the first $100 personal computer. And that box right there is the keyboard. It has a Z80 in it. It has 2K of memory. And you could get a 16K extension, which was necessary for this tracking package. But with the 16K extension, um, you brought your own TV set as a monitor, and you brought your own cassette recorder as a storage device. And at 110 baud, the 16K took about five minutes to load or save. And in that environment, I um, developed a tracking program that AMSAT distributed to HAMS, who wanted to use this to find the satellites that they were trying to work. And um, this was very successful at the time, and that went on my resume. And those two things together on my resume um, showed up as being something of interest to a hiring manager who was looking for someone to do embedded GPS navigation software in a scientific grade GPS receiver that JPL was building um, for research purposes. And so I ended up being hired to do that. Now, I say all this to say that whether it's a professional endeavor, something you were assigned to do at work, or something you did for fun in your hobby, you put both those things on your resume, and you may well find um, an outlet like this that combines them into something that could be a future job that you would know how to do and that you would know how to uh, and that you would enjoy doing. So at JPL, I kind of became very aware that there's basically two things you do with radio. You measure things uh, like Grote Reber did, or you measure distances like GPS does or like radar does, or you move information. And by moving information, I mean you can detect that something is there. That's kind of one bit of information. Or you can move um, billions of bits per second to have high definition information content. Uh, so, either of these things can be done actively or passively, one way or two way. And most of my career was built around some version of that for some mission that JPL was doing. Uh, I was responsible for the GPS receivers that located the space shuttle with a one sigma accuracy of 1.6 meters for the shuttle radar topography mission that made maps of the earth with 10 meter resolution. This is uh, in the year 2000. And later, similarly, I uh, worked on the GRAIL mission, which um, mapped um, the gravity field of the moon. Uh, the actual measurement was done at KA band, at the one centimeter band, but uh, measuring the Doppler between the two spacecraft. But we also had an S band timing link that it, I worked on and um, X band, uh, uh, connections back to the Earth, as shown in this picture. And then later on, as CubeSats became popular um, at NASA and other places, um, we developed a deep space transponder for CubeSats. And so uh, a couple of these have been flown to Mars already on the Marco mission a few years ago. And some more are going to be flown on secondary payloads on CubeSats on the Artemis 1 mission on its test flight uh, coming up soon. So these are the kind of things that um, <laughs> that you know, those entries on one's resume can lead to. And then um, I'll talk for a minute about my final project, which is uh, still ongoing, even though I have retired from JPL, um, which is the Ingenuity Mars helicopter. So Several years ago, this would have been 2014 or 15, um, my JPL colleague and friend, Eric Archer in 6CV uh, came by with uh, something that looked like this. It was a picture of a, of a toy helicopter. And he said, I said, what is this? And 
he says, well, guess what we're going to do? We're going to fly one of these things on Mars. And I said, what are you going to do? <laughs> and so he walked off and left this in my office. And a couple of years later, I was asked by management to take over the design that Eric did for the telecommunication part of the Mars helicopter and to build up the flight versions and deliver that um, through the mission, which is now at Mars. So here's what that system is. Um, there was no way we could use our existing design for radios um, on this because they were all too massive. Now, there's not much air on Mars, and we couldn't take a really big helicopter because of uh, vehicle uh, size constraints. And so we ended up with a helicopter that could lift 1,800 grams, uh, we thought, um, in the Mars environment. And 10 of those grams were allocated out to the telecom system. And so we went out to, um, we went out just shopping for little bitty radios that could do what needed to be done. So what needed to be done, we wanted to kind of have a, a radio range between the rover and the helicopter of a, of a thousand meters, one kilometer. And so to do that, we picked a little device that didn't weigh much that operated at a low ISM band, the 900 megahertz band, uh, that's fairly low frequency for these things, and had a one watt uh, boosted uh, power output. And, you know, based on my experience in uh, VHF contesting, I had contacted people at 20 or 30 kilometer range with some difficulty with uh, handheld units uh, running a watt or two on 900 megahertz. So I thought this probably ought to work and it probably ought to be reasonable. And in the process of uh, working on this, we did a lot of testing to show that um, we could in fact uh, cover several hundred meters uh, or more than a kilometer possibly. Here's the team that worked on this. So I show this just to say that in the United States, um, about one in 500 persons is a ham. If you just divide the number of hams by the population, it's it's about one in 500. Now JPL is a technical institution, and we think based on on the the workforce at JPL and the size of the club and other call sign license plates we see around lab, we think it's it's more like one in 50 there, which isn't too surprising. And then in the section where I worked, where we build the radios, it was more like one in five or or uh, one in ten, something like that. On this particular team, it was about half of the people. I've shown the uh, the call signs here of the uh, the major players, and you know that's not unusual. This is the sort of thing that a ham would do: take something that wasn't really intended for this purpose, and then uh, figure out what you can do with it, repurpose it to uh, <laughs> to provide communication from a Mars helicopter to a Mars rover, and make that work. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, you know, some of these people like me, they came from ham radio into technical careers. Some of these people uh, came from the technical career and then they met us and saw what we were doing and the kind of things we knew. And they said, hey, that looks like fun. I think I'll get a license and join you guys. And so there's, there's uh, cases of both of that in, in this list. So here we are with uh, some of the late stacking pictures. Uh, this here is the 900 megahertz antenna on the solar panel on the um, helicopter as it's attached underneath the rover as we prepare it for launch. This is uh, this is the rover and that's the helicopter right there underneath it. And um, this thing has a little pigtail in it, not because we wanted to make it broader band or have a loading coil there, but because if it was a full length quarter wave, it would scratch the rover and that is verboten. So, um, so we accommodated the antenna and it works fine. Uh, here it is on Mars. That's Mars dirt in the background, and there's the antenna right in the middle of the solar panel, which we call the ground plane, and um, that is the system that's used uh, to communicate to the helicopter. So uh, I retired after Flight 9, but um, this was the proposed radio path that was going to be at the end of Flight 9. They were going to fly from this region over over here. And, you know, they, they would basically come to me and ask, well, is the radio going to work after we land? And I kind of looked at this and I said, well, this is a depression here with these sand dunes in it. So that's great. That's no problem. There's some little rises here, but um, 
you know, if you can physically see the what from one antenna to the other, you know, if you were the helicopter antenna, if you could see optically the uh, rover antenna, then uh, it'll probably work fine. This is only six, seven hundred meters. There's plenty of signal. And in fact, uh, in this particular case, that turned out to be what happened. Um, this is uh, a uh, our radio telemetry data from a flight like that. Um, and the green line at the bottom is the one that I always looked at. That's basically the S meter, which I've converted into ham units, uh, 15 over nine at the beginning here. And then when the thing takes off and flies, you see it, uh, uh, the signal comes up as it gets into the air and uh, you see things happening to it as it flies along over the terrain and so forth. And it lands in a different place and it's only 10 over nine there, but that's plenty as long as they keep this number up um, kind of at the S4 or five reason or above the radio work fine. And in fact, in this whole session, um, this uh, blue line shows the amount of uh, data and bits per second that was passed and everything went perfectly. There was no there was no checksum errors or NACs or anything like that. All the data was fine. And that, that has typically been the case, um, although they did land in a, in a different place on a later flight that was more difficult and had to reposition things to get back into communication. But um, in general, it's worked quite well, um, which was a pleasant uh, surprise to all of us. Um, yeah. So, um, so what have I done in retirement? Well, for the last few years, I've worked on this. This is my own Grote Reber like um, uh, neighbor pleasing installation at my house, a 3.8 meter um, uh, EME dish. And although I'm not making new radio maps the sky, I do have um, VUCC on 1296. And I have uh, worked all continents on uh, 23 centimeters after a few years of um, effort. You can see these uh, awards behind me there. Um, let's see, what else do I do? Well, I'm involved in the San Bernardino Microwave Society, which for about as long as I've been alive has been um, dedicated to the advancement of communication above 1000 megacycles. Uh, this goes way back to the 50s. And uh, there's our website there. And here's a picture of my two foot dish in the back of my truck. And I'm on top of a mountain here, uh, working other similarly equipped people uh, three, four, three or 400 miles away. Uh, we consider that to be pretty good DX uh, mountain topping on uh, 10 gigahertz. And of course, all this is going on below 200 meters, right? Uh, 200 meters and down. So there's a couple of stories I wanted to tell uh, that I couldn't really fit into these examples, but I, I just had to mention Gordon Wood, WA6NVA, who's now passed on, but he was kind of in the generation of um, JPL radio guys uh, before mine. And he told the story on himself that he was in charge of the radios for one of the Mariner missions in the 70s. And they were in the closeout phase when uh, they were in the clean room with the radio and they were looking at, they were doing final testing and, and they um, saw on the spectrum analyzer that the, the carrier balance was not right on the biphase shift keying signal. And, you know, this could have led to a big delay. In the worst case, it could have led to a miss of the launch. You have to demate the radio, you have to do you know, write reports and various things. But Gordon, you know, he was a ham. He knew what the spectrum should look like. Uh, he knew how radios worked. He just basically ran everybody out of the clean room. And then he opened up the radio right there on the spacecraft and and tweaked that carrier balance with his twiddle stick. And then he put it all back together and staked it down and let everybody come back in and it was working fine. And they launched it. And it went to Mars that way, and it worked fine. Um, another story: I, I, I had a, I worked for Al Kangwala, who was one of the uh, leads in deep space navigation. And I was talking to him in the street one day. This is this is not even when I was working for him, but uh, he mentioned to me that in his PhD dissertation he had cited an article that I had written for an AMSAT, for the AMSAT journal in 1986. This was back in, you know, this was an article about um, the statistics of earth orbiting uh, 
uh, passes and, you know, how high do they go and how many minutes per day do you get and that sort of thing. And, and in 1986, you know, this is back when we were uh, drawing pictures with pencils on polar graph paper and copying those into our articles. And <laughs> that thing that I had written had become part of his PhD dissertation because it had some kind of relevance. And I thought, well, you know, is it a small world? Are, are technical hobbies really a necessary part of, of what we do in technology? And of course the answer is both. Um, you know, I was just interested in, in, in that and no one was paying me to do it, but I got on a team and I wrote this paper and, and then it was useful in the uh, engineering community later on. It's very interesting. So as you might guess, I've only talked about a small fraction of what I could have in this talk. And each story I've told, I've only talked about a small fraction of the material there. And um, I know some of you have uh, other stories or more complete versions of this stuff. And I would just challenge each of you to, um, you know, write your own history demonstrating uh, the importance of uh, technical hobbies like amateur radio to society. Eric Guth at 4Z1UG will be happy to help you out and um, um, in, uh, getting this uh, out to the rest of the world. So uh, thank you for your attention. Um, uh, here's my summary. Um, if there's, there, you know, I've already said this many times, there is obviously a need for um, technical hobbies, um, amateur radio and others. And you know, the, the reason is because it's like I said at the beginning, you don't always know where you're headed. You don't always know uh, what will pan out, what will be useful, what, what will be needed. But um, people who can sit around and just try stuff without any huge consequence for failure, well, that's what a hobbyist is. If as a hobbyist, I go down a blind alley with some idea and it doesn't work, um, nothing is lost. If it does work, I might well, as in all these examples, have created a new world that's improved for everybody. And in the case of amateur radio, the cost of having amateur radio is some spectrum that we can have access to for our uh, tests and our activities. This is usually spare, shared spectrum and hams are pretty good about sharing. And that's pretty much the cost, um, you know, but, we need some of that, and the, the current goals of society, which seem to be to use all the spectrum for, for other things, well, it should not be all entirely structured. There should be some unstructured part, and the amateurs provide that quite well. So yes, benefits are too many to list. I've listed several of them. There's hundreds of more, thousands of more. Um, and every accidental discovery like this is a benefit to mankind. So thanks for your attention. And we'll now move on to the question and answer part of the session.